It's my privilege to open to you again as we return to Romans chapter 8. So I'd invite you to stand as we receive this. We're going to begin here at verse 18 and read down through verse 27. This is the Apostle Paul, Romans chapter 8. May God add his blessing to this word. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope we were saved. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And God and his blessing to his word. You, you can be seated. Well, this morning, we want to return to Romans 8. We've been kind of uh, making our way through this really wonderful chapter, but I thought it would be helpful just to review where we have been as we begin this morning. We've, we've covered the idea as we launched into Romans 8 that Paul reports to us that in Christ, we therefore have no condemnation. Our sins have been forgiven. Christ on the cross has destroyed the power of sin and death for us. And we live in the grace of God instead of guilt. But then we discovered a couple of weeks ago the fact that the Holy Spirit is given to us so that Christ, what, what Christ has done for us, the Holy Spirit is going to do in us. That we can live a life close to Jesus. We can live a life where he is in us and we become more and more like him. So we choose to live in the spirit rather than the flesh. And in so doing, we, we become all that God intends for us to be. So as Christians, we have guilt uh, or grace over guilt. And of course, then we have the spirit over the flesh. But this morning, I want us to take this a step further because Paul begins this passage this morning reminding us that in Christ, we also have hope over despair. In Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about a hope that doesn't disappoint. The Apostle Paul picks up this theme again here in chapter 8. And he tells us, reminds us, don't put your hope in the wrong thing. Verse 18 begins this way. I consider our present sufferings. Now, we need to stop right there, I think, this morning. And, and I'd like us to make that personal. I want you for a moment to think about your present sufferings. What are they? In order for us, I think, to fully experience the power of this passage, we have to take a moment and think about what those present sufferings are. Maybe it's something you're going through, or maybe it's something you just fear. And in this past year, a lot of us have experienced a whole host of different emotions and situations and frustrations. But what are your present sufferings. Take a moment and, and just name it. Fill it in the, fill in the blank. Because one of the things I have learned over the years in ministry is that everyone I've ever met is facing a battle. Without exception, we might look great on the outside, but inside there are wounds and scars. There are hurts. 
And for a moment, I want us to name them. I want us to think about them. What are those present sufferings? Now, it might be health-related. It might be someone that, that you love who is facing a health condition, or, or maybe it's yourself. Maybe it's a battle with mental health or a, a suffering that results from addiction. Some in this room have been suffering with anxiety, maybe related to finances, or maybe it's relational. Maybe, maybe it's a situation in your family, and boy, these things come to real relief on Mother's Day. Or maybe the present suffering is sitting right next to you right now, this morning, and you know his name. His name's Joe, and you could name that. But when you fill in that blank, what comes to mind? Now, if you've listened to my preaching over the years, you know how disgusted I get at those preachers who will tell you that when you come to Jesus Christ, it's all going to be wonderful. We, we have a popular notion today, and there are a lot of preachers who do very well at preaching. You come to Christ, and things will be only but bliss if you're on God's team, God has it all laid out. He has a perfect plan for your life, and you will be wonderful. And of course, as we've seen even this morning with Jack's testimony, what about Paul who was beaten and later executed? What about Jesus himself who went to the cross? Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. And I think that's pretty verifiable. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Talk, Paul, the apostle, talks about present suffering as if it is a given. You have them. I have them too. But here's the thing. One of the things we have to recognize is that our present sufferings then will reveal what we put our hope in. Our, our present sufferings, whatever they may be, have a way, have a tendency to show us what we live, our, what is the foundation of our lives. What, what the storm does, it reveals the, the effectiveness, the strength of our foundation. You may recall the name of Viktor Frankl. He was a Jewish-Austrian psychoanalyst who was imprisoned by the Nazis at Auschwitz. Frankl had the presence of mind while he was there to begin to study his fellow prisoners and how they dealt with suffering. He wrote a book called Man's Search for Meaning. He noted that some of the prisoners responded to their brutality where everything was stripped from them, that many of them became brutal themselves. They became hard-hearted and cruel. And I want to just take a moment this morning and, and recognize that I can relate to that. I can understand it. Maybe you've seen it. Suffering comes and you just become cold and hard. In losing hope, you are hard and harsh with other people. And, and man, this is a ministry given. Hurt people often will hurt other people. You come to a point when you don't see good in any situation. You just see everyone as, as not getting it. That's the way some people deal with hopelessness. Franco also observed that some of the prisoners would do well for a while, but then came a moment when they just gave up. He, he writes it this way. He says, usually this happened quite suddenly the symptoms of which were familiar to experienced inmates. We all feared this moment for our friends. Usually it would begin one morning when the prisoner simply refused to get dressed or wash or go out to the grounds for inspection. No entreaties, no blows, no threats had any effect. They just laid there. They had given up. They had lost all hope. What, what do you do when there is no hope? They quit. Now, he noted that many people responded to their suffering by putting their hope in what life would be one day outside of the camp. 
In other words, they, they may have had money or status or a family that they loved, achievements, and they fashioned for themselves a dream that those things would be restored to them once they were free. Franco found, however, that once the prisoners were released from their concentration camp, there was this epidemic of despair and depression and suicide among the prisoners because many of those things were not restored. They were never the same again. They put their hope, in other words, in something that wasn't real. They had a false hope. But this is one of the discoveries that Frankel made. He said that the ones who truly overcame Auschwitz were those who, quote, had a fixed reference point beyond this world. A fixed reference point beyond this world. Something that, that was out of the grasp of death and darkness and destruction something that death couldn't touch. They were the ones who were able to endure. Franco wrote, life in concentration camps tear open the soul and exposes its depth and foundation. Now Paul here talks about people suffering, these present sufferings, and then I want you to see he gives us a fixed reference point. He tells us to remember our hope is in heaven. Now, now let, let me keep reading this, and, and, and let's just think about what he says here. I consider that this, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. Now, this is what Paul is saying. He says, You've got your present sufferings identified. You can name that. You know what those are. I want you to compare your present sufferings to the glory that's going to be revealed in you. I want you to compare what you're going through right now to what one day you will experience when you get to heaven. He said, in fact, it's not worth comparing. Lee Strobel gives us an example that kind of illustrates what Paul is saying here. He says, and imagines it this way, he says, imagine that it's the first day of the year. In our case, for our purpose, it's January 1st, 2021, let's say. And it's like the worst day ever. You have a root canal on January 1st. I don't know who schedules a January 1st root canal, but let's say that happens. During the root canal, halfway through, the anesthesia wears off, and it gets ugly from there. But you survive, you get out of there, you're in your car, you're headed home, but you're distracted by the pain and the frustration, and so you're in an accident. You total the car. Now, you're, you're okay, but as you get out, you realize that the other car that you hit was your wife's car, and so things get even worse. Somehow you make it home, you go to the mailbox, and you take out a foreclosure notice. And as you're reading that foreclosure notice, you get a text from your boss, and he says, don't bother coming in on January 2nd because your job has now been terminated. And you're thinking, how much more can I take? You go in, again, it's January 1st, so you watch the Rose Bowl, and Ohio State loses the Rose Bowl. <laughs> Imagine, it can't get worse. Now that was my part, I added that. But, but let's just imagine then that January 2nd comes. And things begin to look up. You suddenly get an email and you discover that you had a rich uncle you'd long forgotten about. But he's left you $42 million, apparently. And so you think, well, I got money to buy a car. And you'd not only buy a car, it's your dream car. 
And then you go out and eventually you buy a home and it's your dream house and everything begins to look up. But you've got all this money, so you make some investments and you make an investment in this startup. It's an R&D company. You don't know much about it. But suddenly, in a, just a couple of weeks, they've discovered the cure for cancer. And their stock skyrockets and you are just a billionaire many times over. Tahitian Island comes, uh, you know, I, I should have said uh, in this new house that you're living in, my goodness, the great thing is, is that you discover that Michael Jordan is your neighbor, and he comes over and says, hey, can we play basketball together, you know, and wants to shoot hoops and that kind of thing. Then you end up on this Tahitian Island, you've got a great vacation place, couldn't have been better. Now imagine by the time the end of the year arrives, January 3rd, or December 31st, and someone comes at your New Year's Eve party and they say, hey, how has your year been? What are you going to say to them? Well, if they knew you before, you're going to say to them, it's been a great year. Are you kidding me? I mean, you can visit me at the Tahitian Island or maybe you can join us for some hoops with Michael Jordan. I don't care. But it's been a great year. He said, well, I'm so glad to hear you say that because, my goodness, after all, I remember, I think it was on Facebook, you posted what was happening to you on January 1st, how awful it was, and I felt so sorry for you. And you say, well, I forgot about that compared to the rest of the year. I'd forgotten. Yeah, that was a rough, rough day, but man, compared to the rest of this year, it's not even worth comparing. That's a perspective, okay, that heaven gives us. You may in this life go through a very difficult season. In fact, your entire life may be very difficult. It may be filled with chronic pain, hardship, suffering. But when it's been 533,223,414 years in heaven and someone comes up to you and says, how's your existence going? What are you going to say to them? They're going to say it's great. Heaven is wonderful. God is good. There's no mourning. There's no pain. There are no tears here. There is no sickness here. I am a child of God. St. Teresa of Avila, if you study her, fascinating life. But she experienced a lot of chronic issues, suffering and disappointment. But toward the end of her life, here's how she summed up her hope. She says this, in light of heaven, the worst sufferings on this earth will seem to be no more serious than one night in an inconvenient hotel. I like that picture. Mary and I remember when we were newly married, we were visiting her parents in Pennsylvania. Well, we knew that a winter storm was coming. It was New Year's Eve, and we needed to get back to Kentucky. So we decided that we would leave early and head home again on New Year's Eve. However, instead of beating the storm, we ran right into it. And I'll never forget the swerving we were doing on that highway. We, we ended up just crawling inch by inch with all the ice in Pennsylvania and the hills of Maryland. We were just crawling and finally said, enough is enough. Of course, this was the days before cell phones and check-ins and all kinds of things that we can do today. So we just got off the highway and started looking for a place to stay, a hotel. We started with the chains. One after the other, we found that they were filled up. But one nice manager said, I bet you'll find a place down the street. Now, it was an absolute dive, okay? But we went in, and they had one room left. But hey, we got a room. But I remember 
The ice, in fact, I remember the ice was so bad, Mary will recall this too, we were slipping, you know, just trying to get up the steps. We had to hand, hold on to the stair rail. The, the storm was so terrible that night just to get in. But it turned out that this room was over a bar on New Year's Eve. <laughs> the bed was uncomfortable. The TV didn't work. The bathroom didn't look like it had been serviced in quite some time, and there was this smell that we could not identify, but it burned when you breathed in. <laughs> you ever been there? Now, we put up with that because we knew we were heading home. We had to stay there for a night but home was just a few hours away. And we knew we were safe. In Philippians, Paul talks about to live is Christ and to die is gain. In fact, he says, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm torn here. Is it better for me to go and be with Jesus in heaven or is it better for me to be here with you? He says, I'm torn. He realizes that if I am still here, it means that God has a purpose for me. He has a purpose, and it's okay with me if God takes me home. Either way, because my hope isn't here. Are you with me? Verse 22, I, I, I want to read this from the New Living Translation because I think it brings it out a little clearer. But it says, For we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to this present time. And even we Christians, although we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, we also groan to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope. We wait expectantly, excitedly for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he's promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. Now, here's the thing. I want you to notice this metaphor that Paul uses here to teach us how we should deal with these present sufferings. What our mindset should be as we go through these present sufferings. And did you notice that the metaphor is that of the pains of childbirth? That's what he compares it to. This is my Mother's Day message, okay? Happy Mother's Day. He says, look, the suffering of this life is like the pains of childbirth. Now, I've read before, and I don't want to go into a whole thing about this, but I've read before that the two most painful things you can experience is, on average, childbirth and what? Passing a kidney stone. Now, I'm not going to get into a spitting contest here, okay, but... But I have done one of these things. <laughs> and not done the other. Of course, in our crazy world today, as we see this week, some people are objecting to the term mother. They prefer the term what? Birthing person. As if, you know, Lord, help us. Lord Jesus, come quickly. The world is going insane. But on a purely physical level, these two things are extraordinarily painful. But how you process that pain is remarkably different, if you think about it. And because, you know, it's possible that after giving birth, a mother might say, you know, let's do this again. <laughs> now, that may not be immediate. It may take some time, but very often... But you will never hear, you have never heard someone who passes a kidney stone say, maybe God will bless me with another one. 
<laughs> not going to happen. Not me. The pain is intense for both. But there's a difference, isn't there? One leads to a baby, and the other leads to a kidney stone. And if you think about it, in both cases, they look like Winston Churchill, so it's... <laughs> But how we process that pain is so different because of what's on the other side. That's what Paul is talking about here, that there is this present suffering, but it's like the pain of childbirth. It leads to something beautiful, to something very, very good. Bertrand Russell was a, famous atheist who lived in the last century. He was an outspoken atheist, as a matter of fact, who wrote a book called Why I Am Not a Christian. And when he was 81 years old, his health was deteriorating. He happened to be interviewed by a British Broadcasting Corporation radio station, and the interviewer asked him this question, what do you have, now that you're coming to the end of your life, what do you have to hang on to when death is so close. Russell responded this way, and I appreciate his honesty. He said, I have nothing to hold on to but grim, unyielding despair. Because for him, nothing was left. When it was all stripped away, he had nothing but a kidney stone. This is what I want you to see. Paul says the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. I think one of the things the Holy Spirit does is remind us of heaven. He's a, he's a glimpse of the future glory, but he helps us in our present suffering. And maybe you just need to hear that this morning. Maybe you need to run to him this morning. We have this hope of heaven, but we also have the help of the Holy Spirit. And he says, we do not often know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Have you ever been there? When you face that point, when you don't know how to pray, and you don't know where to go, and you, God is so good that the Holy Spirit prays for us. You ever try to pray and nothing comes? You don't know how to pray. You don't want to pray. You're too angry to pray. You're too hurt to pray. The Holy Spirit says, let me take it from here for you. That's how good God is. There are two words that jump out at me in this passage. The first word, of course, is hope. It's used some six times in the NIV in this section. But the other word, I think, is equally important. And that is the word wait. We wait. We wait eagerly. We wait patiently. We wait confidently, but we wait. Verse 19, all of creation waits in eager expectation. There are present sufferings, but if we put our hope in the wrong things of this world, we end up with despair. But if we put our hope in Jesus, and we wait with all of creation. One day, God's glory will be revealed in you and in me. Amen. Amen. Mary, uh, and uh, Mary, as you know, many of you, lived for a time in Hawaii when she was a teenager. So for our 25th anniversary, I decided we were going to Hawaii. She had not been there since she left when she was 18. And we had to splurge to go there. But I got to tell you, one of the things I learned about that is those months leading up to that trip were so much fun. The trip itself was great, but the anticipation of the trip 
was also something to remember. You know, I realized it didn't matter that work was hard or the weather was bad. It didn't matter that maybe I had an argument with someone. Why? I was going to Hawaii. <laughs> Made a real difference in my outlook. Friends, this morning, is heaven on your calendar? Only one way to get there through Jesus Christ who even today reaches out to us and says if you follow me follow me home follow me to heaven make sure he is your savior today